All right, let me open us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. We thank you that you uh, are a covenant-keeping God who makes promises, who keeps promises. We are the beneficiaries of your nature, your character, your commitment to your own integrity. And even as we look at the nation of Israel and your dealings, past, present, and future, we pray that we would be encouraged, encouraged to trust, encouraged to pray, uh, encouraged to bank on the promises of your word, but also to heed the warnings and the commands of your word. And we ask for help in this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking in this series at Israelology, a study of the nation of Israel and its past and its present and its future. And I hope you haven't said to yourself, self, I'm not Jewish. And so this is interesting and intellectual uh, and helpful from a distance. Um, I hope instead you catch the import of all that we're talking about. Because for any individual Christian thinking about our escape from sin, our rescue by God, our being sustained by God's grace, our, the importance of our heeding God's warnings and keeping His commands. We look back on the history of Israel and we see ourselves in the story, at least I hope you do. That in Israel's failings, we catch a glimpse of our own fickleness, of our own failures, of our own weakness. In Israel's penchant for idolatry, I, I hope you see in your own heart the temptation to go after lesser things than the one true God. To entertain in your heart loves that compete with affectionate loyalty to Him. And then I hope in our study of Israel, we see the very character and nature of God, which leads us to the truths of the gospel, those unilateral commitments of God to save the unlovely, to save the unworthy, to rescue sinners, that God will actually act where the recalcitrant sinner is unable when we are left to ourselves, we cannot choose for God. We cannot wake up and pull up our own moral bootstraps. In the words of God's new covenant commitment to Israel, we could not circumcise our own hearts, make for ourselves new hearts, or raise the field of, of skeletons to new life and put flesh on the bones. Those are all metaphors, of course, of what God is able to do to raise those who are spiritually dead unto spiritual life and to keep them according to his purposes for his own glory. We've been looking at Israel in the past and we noticed her covenants, that is those promises that God made to the nation. One of those was a bilateral covenant, if you do this, I'll do this, sort of a two-sided bargain. And the others were one-sided. God just promised, I'm going to do this and this and this. And we looked at that bilateral covenant, the Mosaic covenant, where God promised Israel they would be blessed if they obey, they would get to live in the land, they would live up to their commission before the world. And God also indicated in the giving of that promise that they would fail. And God made the unilateral promise that He would retrieve them from their dispersion, from their exile, from their scattering to the four corners of the earth, one day bring them back into the land and give them new hearts, which dovetails right into the new covenant promise. God also promised the Davidic covenant, which was a promise that someone from the Davidic line would actually rule over Israel in Jerusalem over the nations. These promises for the new covenant, the Davidic covenant, have yet to come to pass. And the unbreakable portions of the Mosaic covenant, where God said, I will bring you back to the land and you will love me, that has yet to come to pass. So even though we dealt with the covenants in terms of Israel's past, I would suggest to you that they still stand for Israel's present. In other words, they are checks not yet cashed. They are promises unfulfilled. They are outstanding commitments from the one true God. And when you read your Old Testament and you, you notice promises of God, whether they're given uh, towards nations or whether they're given towards the people of Israel, uh, 
if there is not a historical date at which any of those promises came to pass, then you need to put a question mark in the margin of your Bible with the simple word, when. Don't assume that because it hasn't come to pass, that it will not come to pass. For to do so would be to make God a liar. To make God one who goes back on his promises, one who does not keep his word. Rather, our attitude ought to be, God will keep his word. This hasn't happened yet. And so in a very real sense, we, as we think about Israel, we sit in the tension of promises made and not yet fulfilled. That's important to keep in mind as we walk through the present condition of the nature of Israel. Let's look first at Matthew chapter 23. Jesus, by the way, who was Jewish, he was in the line of Judah, he was a descendant of David, he is actually Israel's Messiah. As a Jew, in Matthew 23, Of course, more than a Jew, he is God in the flesh. But he assesses Israel's condition, focusing specifically on her leadership. What were the spiritual leaders of Israel like in Jesus' day? How how were they characterized? These are the scribes, that is, those who copied the Word of God. Their job was to make sure the Word of God was kept accurately and passed on in successive generations. They were experts in the law of God. They settled disputes about interpretations of the Scripture. They were the, the gatekeepers of the understanding of God's very Word. And then you had the Pharisees. These were the religious leaders in Jesus' day. They were the gatekeepers of those who worshipped God in all of the, uh, of the nation's religious ceremonies. And then you had the Sadducees, who were more of a, a political group who held power in Israel. And this trifecta, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, made up the group of people who led the nation of Israel in Jesus' day. And, and what does Jesus say to them? Matthew 23, woe to you. This word woe is the calling down of heaven's curses and judgment upon them. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. What is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is one who wears a mask, one who pretends to be something on the outside that he is not on the inside. Because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. You do not enter it yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. This is a stunning indictment for the religious leadership. They're the ones who are supposed to point people to God, and Jesus looks at them and says, you don't even know God, and you prevent other people from knowing God. And think about the fact that Israelites in the day would have looked to the scribes and the Pharisees as the most righteous, and Jesus says of them, they don't have what it takes to get in. He goes on, verse 14, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. What does it mean that they devour widows' houses? Widows represented the class of people in Israel that were the most needy and absolutely dependent on the nation, led by its leadership, political and religious, to care for them. They were the welfare net for the orphans and the widows. They were supposed to be. And here, what are they doing? They are devouring widows' houses. You have the remarkable scene where the disciples of Jesus following him into Jerusalem are so impressed with all the great buildings, all the architecture, all the fancy doings of Israel in its capital. Teacher, look at these magnificent buildings. And Jesus says to, them, says to them, do you not know that not one stone will be left upon another? God's going to take the whole thing apart in judgment. And specifically, that address by Jesus to his disciples was given in the context of the poor widow giving her last two copper coins to the temple treasury. What was happening there? This was her subsistence, and she should have been provided for by the religious leadership. 
The temple treasury should have been going into her pocket just so that she could live. And instead, they were demanding her last two copper coins so they could line their own pockets, build their magnificent buildings, wear their luxurious clothes, eat their fancy foods by oppressing the widow, taking the last of what she had. They're complete hypocrites. They're corrupt. And notice Jesus says, for a pretense you make long prayers. This is outward religiosity. And it is completely vacuous inside. God is not pleased with it. Their prayers don't make it to heaven. Do you remember Jesus addressing the the Pharisee and the tax collector? And the tax collector is saying, Lord, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. And the Pharisee says, uh, Jesus actually says, he prays to himself, I thank you that I'm not like one of these sinners. And Jesus says, The one who admitted he was a sinner went home justified before God. The religious hypocrites pray long prayers to impress each other and impress themselves. And Jesus says they receive greater condemnation. Verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, one convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. What is their motivation in traveling the world in order to get people to follow them? They're building their own little empire. They're not seeking to lead people to God. Woe to you blind guides who say, whoever swears by the temple, that's nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. You fools, Jesus says, and blind men. Which is more important, the gold or the temple that sanctified the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, that's nothing, but whoever swears by the offering on it, he's obligated. You blind men, which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering? Therefore, Jesus says, whoever swears by the altar, swears both by the altar and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple, swears both by the temple and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven, swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. What were the religious leaders doing? They were bifurcating all these minuscule rules according to their own traditions. They had woven an intricate tapestry of how to do what they wanted you to do so that they could control the people. You could never live up to the Pharisees' standards of livings. They couldn't live up to their standards themselves. They were hypocrites through and through, and yet they held the people to a standard they themselves could not keep. He goes on in verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You tithe mint and dill and cumin. That is, you're you're giving a tenth as an offering to God of these teeny tiny little spices in your spice cabinet. And you've neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. Verse 24, he calls them blind guides. You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. That's a really interesting picture. I don't know if you've thought that through. I don't want bugs in my cereal, even though all the cereal boxes, if you read the fine print, are required to tell you, by order of the Federal Food and Drug Administration, how many particles of bugs exist in your cereal by percentage of weight. I don't know if you've seen the fine print. Um, I'd like to strain out gnats. I don't want them in my cornflakes. But here they've gone to all all the duty of straining out the gnats and swallowing camels. It's a stunning depiction of their hypocrisy. It was hypocrisy that everybody could see. He says in verse 25, You're hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of robbery and self indulgence. Again, religious on the outside. Filthy on the inside. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. There was nothing more defiling under the law than corpses, tombs, and bones. And Jesus says, you're full of it. You're defiled through and through. Outwardly, verse 28, you appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. 
Woe to you, verse 29, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You build the tombs of the prophets, you adorn the monuments of the righteous, and you say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. What does Jesus say? He knows their intent, their murderous intent. They will actually follow through on this murder intent, murderous intent and kill Jesus himself. And then he closes the section with the rhetorical question, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? This is an interesting reference all the way back to Genesis 3.15. You remember after Adam and Eve sinned and God confronted them in the garden, God said to Satan, the woman will have a seed that will crush your head and you will crush his heel. He says that your children will be at enmity with her children. What's fascinating here is Jesus calls the Pharisees brood of vipers. What is that? A nest of baby snakes. He's calling them the children of Satan in a direct reference to a passage they would know. Jesus' indictment here is searing. And of course, the culmination of this is they're trumping up charges against him, conscripting the Romans to do their dirty work, inciting the crowd to cry out, crucify, crucify. And then they are parties to the worst crime ever committed in human history, deicide, the murder of God in the flesh. This is stunning when you think about all that Israel had been given, all that she had been entrusted with as a nation. Paul said, you had the very oracles of God. And where did they find themselves when God himself came to his own? filled with murderous intent as a nation. Of course, there were exceptions. God keeps a remnant. We'll talk about remnant theology in a moment. But the spiritual condition of the nation in Jesus' day was apostate. It had gone away from faithfulness to covenant long ago. And the culmination of its unfaithfulness was actually the destruction of their hope. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 29. As outsiders looking in, we might look at Israel's past and Israel's present. And, And when I discuss Israel's present, I mean, let's think about from the New Testament era up to the modern era, uh, the last 2,000 years or so of Israel's history. The present as recorded in the pages of the New Testament all the way down to our day. We might look on and say, why has the people of God been dispersed to the ends of the earth, persecuted everywhere they've gone? Why have there been holocausts and genocides down to our very day? And we go all the way back to Mosaic law and we get the answer. Deuteronomy 29 verse 24. All the nations will say, why has Yahweh done this to this land? Why this outburst of anger? Men will say, because they forsook the covenant of Yahweh, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods whom they have not known, whom he had not allotted to them. Therefore, the anger of Yahweh burned against that land to bring upon it every curse which is written in this book. And Yahweh uprooted them from their land in anger and in fury and in great wrath and cast them into another land as it is this day. The secret things belong to Yahweh our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of this law. That prediction came before Israel was even in the land. God knew they would be unfaithful. He knew he would expel them. This is the explanation for Israel's present condition. Turn to Romans chapter 10. We saw Jesus' indictment of the nation of Israel. 
Let's look at Paul's assessment. Romans 10, 1 to 3. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Messiah is the end of law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Paul was a Jew. In fact, when you read his own autobiographical sketch in Philippians chapter 3, he says, I'm a, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's, he's the best of the best of the Jewish nation. He was the cream of the crop. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, a beloved tribe in the nation of Israel. He was a Pharisee under the indictments we just read from the lips of Jesus in Matthew 23. In fact, he was so zealous for God in his own mind that he was willing to kill Christians, those that he deemed had defected from Judaism to follow a false Messiah. And of course, you know what happened. Paul met Jesus personally on the road to Damascus and was upended, overturned, transformed, humbled. And he came to genuine faith in Messiah. And you think about the well of knowledge that Paul had as a, as a teacher of God's word, though without knowledge, though without faith, without repentance, without spiritual life. And when he came to faith, he experienced what Jesus described as a treasury of the knowledge of God's word, but now with the lights turned on. And I don't know if you've had the experience of maybe growing up in church and having to read the Bible or being told Bible stories. And then when you came to faith in Christ, all of a sudden those stories got new life, new meaning. You understood them. It's like scales fall off the eyes. Paul experienced all of that as a Jew, beloved by God as part of God's people, but at enmity with God, an enemy of the gospel. Paul came to faith, and now looking back on his nation, he says, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. Think about Paul's life. Everywhere he went, he was hounded by the Jews who hated the gospel and particularly hated the fact that this Pharisee had believed that Jesus was Messiah. What is Paul's response? I love them. He even goes so far as to say, if it were possible, maybe even for me to be separated from God so that they could be saved, maybe perhaps I might want that. He can't quite bring himself to all the way say it. But you feel his heart in this, and he, he gets the heart of his Savior. You remember Jesus when he crested the hill, the Mount of Olives, looking in on Jerusalem, the apostate city, and he wept in sorrow and grief over the apostate condition of the nation. This is how Paul feels. And what does he say about them in Romans 10? I testify that they have a zeal for God. They have God talk. They claim loyalty and fidelity to the one true God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Well, they have lots of information. They've puffed themselves up with knowledge, but not the personal knowledge of God through relationship by Jesus Christ in the gospel. They've actually rejected Christ, and so they can't know God. And then he says in verse three, for not knowing about God's righteousness. What do you mean not knowing about God's righteousness? Don't they have the whole Old Testament detailing the righteousness of God? Yes, they did not understand that the standard of God's righteousness was the standard they had to meet. They couldn't meet that. Look what they replaced God's standard of righteousness with. Seeking to establish their own. <laughs> Listen, God demands perfection. You know the human protest to that. Anytime Christians start talking about the sin of humanity, the protest goes up, well, nobody's perfect. Right. <laughs> that doesn't change the standard. The standard is still perfection. Perfection. As if nobody's perfect gets us all off the hook. It doesn't get us off the hook at all. 
It demands that we need a resource outside of ourselves. If the nobody's perfect protest caused God to lower the standard, ah, just do whatever you can. Try your hardest. Be your best. Just love people. Have we even done that? <laughs> can anybody even live up to his own made-up quasi-standards? Nobody does. The problem is not with the standard. The, the problem is with the human heart. We need a solution, a righteousness that we could never provide. Here's what Paul says about Israel. Not knowing about God's righteousness, and they had the greatest access to the testimony of all of this truth right there in God's word. And instead, seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. And then you get this fantastic explanation in verse 4. For Messiah, for Christ, is the end. He's the telos, the completion, the, the goal, if you will. He, he's what brings all of this to a halt because he finishes it out. Uh, what does he bring to an end? Law for righteousness. You should see hyphens between those words. Law for righteousness. Christ brings every attempt to bootstrap your own morality before God to a screeching halt. And listen, the condition of apostate Israel is the rejection of God's perfect standard and God's perfect solution to meet that standard. They reject both. What do they replace it with? Oh, let me lower the standard to something I can meet. Then they don't meet that, but then they take pride in the fact that they think they have or maybe they hope they will. And what we've just described in Israel's apostate spiritual condition is the condition of the whole world apart from Christ. Pick your culture, pick your heredity, pick your religious practice, pick your non-religious practice, pick your generalized spirituality, pick your golden rule, whatever it is, mankind's best efforts fall infinitely short of what God demands. And the funny thing is man takes pride in it as if it's something. Again, Paul in his own autobiographical sketch in Philippians 3 says all of it is a pile of rubbish that is to be rejected in order to have Christ. How did Paul view the spiritual condition of Israel in his day? They were apostate and he had compassion and love for them as, as his countrymen and as those who were specially privileged with the very word of God. Think about church history since Paul's day down to the 20th and the 21st centuries. The state spiritually of the nation of Israel has not changed. They have not nationally repented, embraced Jesus as Messiah. They are still in the same state as a nation, as an ethnicity, as a people today as they were in Paul's day, as they were in Jesus' day. The interesting difference in our day, however, is there's no temple. The temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. Uh, the Roman general Titus Vespasian uh, rolled through and flattened it. Did exactly what Jesus said would happen. Removed every stone from every other stone and threw them off of the temple mount so they collapsed uh, many stories down on the pavement below. Nothing left on the, on the temple mount uh, from, the, from the temple that existed in Jesus' day. They don't have sacrifices. They can't follow Mosaic law. They can't keep the three festivals and feasts with, with all the requirements of the priesthood and, and the Levites and the animal sacrifices. They haven't been able to do that for two millennia. The tragic reality is that any Jew alive today, a religious practicing Jew, can't actually practice the religion. Mosaic law is unkeepable, not just because of the condition of the human heart, no one could ever keep it anyway, but also physically, it's impossible to even try. And so what do you have in Judaism today? For the most part, those of Jewish descent in our day are professed atheist or professed agnostic. And a vast majority are just simply secular. And there are religious Jews in our day of various sorts. Reformed Judaism is very liberal. 
kind of sounds uh, maybe backwards. Uh, but the reformed branch of, of modern religious Judaism is very liberal, embracing basically every cause out there. And then you have orthodox Judaism of many different stripes and lots of infighting and denominationalism, if you will. But they can't keep Mosaic law, the strictest adherence of religious Judaism today. Uh, they don't have the temple, they don't have the sacrifices, they don't have the priesthood. They can't actually do what God demanded under Mosaic law. To be a religious Jew today, according to the, the leaders of Judaism, requires, well, we don't have a temple. Um, just do your best and hope that God thinks it's okay. That's the best that religious Judaism can do today. And the real tragedy of the, of the current state of Jewish descent is this agnostic view. It's the view that acknowledges that the God of the Bible is the one true God, and we are the people of that one true God, but God has dealt very severely with us and we don't like Him. Now, I know that's a broad brush, but I would say that is the, the, the broad perspective of Judaism in our world. And from a human perspective, who could blame that perspective? What would it be like to be a, a Jew during the, the pogroms of the Middle Ages, where they were forced to wear yellow stars and they were moved into ghettos, and then they were exterminated? By the way, that was centuries before Hitler. Hitler didn't do anything new in the 20th century. What would it be like to be a Jew trying to live in Israel and the Christian crusades march into town? and they kill all the Muslims and Jews in Jerusalem. That still leaves a bitter aftertaste in Israel to this day. There are still crusader forts in the land where these atrocities were committed by those who swung the sword in the name of Christ. They were, of course, not Christians, but they carried the name. Who could blame the Jews as a people for being bitter? And, and theirs is a real bitterness. This agnostic perspective is fueled by a biblical ignorance. I've been struck uh, a number of times um, where I've had opportunity to ask Jews who had some religious Jewish practice in their, in their background, in their family, have you ever read, and, and I love to ask about the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Daniel. I was on an airplane uh, with a, a, a Jewish uh, woman, probably in her 60s, and up to that point, I had not had the opportunity to ask somebody who, had, who was a Jew, who was a, a Bible-reading Jew, what they thought of Isaiah 53. And I happened to be here uh, preaching through the Isaiah 40s. And so I was working on a sermon on the plane. I had the Hebrew text of, of Isaiah 40-something up on my computer. And, and this lady leaned over and said, is that Hebrew? I said, uh, yes, do you know Hebrew? Well, I, I studied Hebrew in Hebrew school as a child. Uh, went to synagogue growing up. I said, oh, do you still read Hebrew? She said, oh, a little bit. Do you, do you want to read something with me? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on some, some Hebrew text. Um, I didn't tell her I was preparing sermons. I didn't tell her I was a Christian. This is just Hebrew text and a Jew who remembered some of her Hebrew from Hebrew school as a child. And I said, have you, have you ever read the prophets? No, no, we weren't allowed to read the prophets. So you've never read Isaiah? Oh no, we just read Torah, first five books. And I said, do you want to read this with me? And we put Hebrew text, English text side by side, and she just read it. I didn't say anything. And, and I asked her, who is this talking about? Long pause and a deep sigh, and she said, it's Jesus. I know it's Jesus. Why didn't they let us read the prophets? <laughs> She, she started getting frustrated with the, the fact that they were never allowed to read this. It was so obvious to her in that moment that it could be none other 
than Jesus of Nazareth who came in the first century and did the things that Isaiah 53 so clearly describes. And there is a reason that that text is not read in synagogues, not taught in Hebrew school. And she lamented, she said, why didn't they let us read the prophets? And I took her to Daniel and to Zechariah 12. I said, listen, there's hope for the whole nation. There's coming a day when when Jews will read the prophets. And and look what this text says, Zechariah 12.10. They will look on Yahweh whom they pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. Look, it says the Spirit of God will pour out the Spirit of grace and supplication. En masse, Israel will repent and believe. And I took her to Romans 11 and showed her that for a time, Gentiles are believing in the Messiah that God promised to Israel. And a time is coming when Israel en masse as a nation will believe. So what do you think about that? She said, it's too late for me. (laughs) No, it's not too late for you. And I don't know what happened to this dear woman. We, we prayed, we shook hands, and that was it. I don't know what she did with that. I've had other shorter, similar opportunities to unfold Old Testament prophecies about Christ with modern Jews. And there is this profound sorrow and sadness that believes we have been dealt a heavy blow by God so we're not going to have anything to do with him. It's a, it's a remarkable hardness of heart. They are dispersed as a nation irreligious, biblically illiterate, hardened, blinded. And none of this, of course, is new. All of this was prophesied in, in the Old Testament that their backs would be bent, but, but not forever. That their necks would be stiffened, but not forever. That their hearts would be stony, but not forever. The current state of Israel is an apostate spiritual condition. It will not always be so. What is Israel's relationship to the church? I have some passages on the screen for you. Colossians 3.11, Paul describing the, the church, which was a mystery in the Old Testament, birthed in Acts 2 with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a new institution, and then he describes it in verse 11, this is a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew between circumcised and uncircumcised, between barbarian, Scythian, slave, and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. What does he describe there? He's not saying that uh, ethnic ethnic distinctions have gone away forever. Uh, That's clear in the context. He says, in Christ there's neither slave nor free. Then at the end of the chapter, he goes on and tells slaves what to do and how to live. It's not a denial of their ontology, of of who they are or their identity, but it is a recognition that in Christ there is a leveling out. If you're a Jew in Christ, you have full free access to Christ and all the benefits of being in the church. And if you are a Gentile in Christ, you have full access to God. You were an outsider, now you're an insider. Full benefits of being in the church. Paul says in Galatians the same thing. There's neither Jew nor free, neither male nor female. He's not erasing male-female distinctions, but he is saying male and female are leveled out in the gospel in Christ, full access to God through the forgiveness of sin purchased by the blood of Christ. The great reality of the church is the, the, the removal of the barriers that kept Gentiles out of the inner court, that kept them out of direct access to God. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 11. Paul the Jew, writing to predominant Gentile audience, says, Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you, 
were at that time separate from Messiah, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Messiah Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, He made both groups into one, and he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. What is this barrier of dividing wall, and how is it broken down? Verse 15, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two, Jew and Gentile, into one new man, thus establishing peace. He might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. What does Paul say? Mosaic law came down so that Jew and Gentile could be together in one entity, this new thing called the church. Couldn't exist with Mosaic law in place. What does this mean for Gentiles and Jews who are in? Um, We're the church. This gives us a little window into something God is doing with Israel in the present. This is the doctrine of the remnant. There are individual Jews who believe the gospel and come into the church. And we we can think of examples in our own day. Uh, We can certainly think of examples in the time of the New Testament. In the first generation of the New Testament, most of the church was Jewish. And eventually the gospel went out from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth and became increasingly, overwhelmingly Gentile. But in every generation, God has saved Jews. And you can trace that out through church history. And and they are not to become some separate spiritual entity from the church. I believe that the attempts of Christians to sort of redo Judaism uh, are misguided. Uh, Sort of the the Hebrew roots movements uh, and other things like that where where we feel like we have to be under Mosaic law or do uh, Mosaic law dietary restrictions or keep festivals and Sabbaths and ceremonies and robes and all of that stuff misses what God has done new in taking the gospel out of Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. This is a new thing called the church. God is not done with Israel in part because he keeps a remnant. But turn to Romans 9. We need to see the big picture of what God is doing in the present. If you read through the the book of Romans, you, you see a very cogent argument with logical connections from one point to another all the way through the book. And some would see Romans 9 to 11 as an insertion, sort of a parenthesis in the logical argument. Because in Romans 9 to 11, Paul deals with some, uh, some pretty difficult subjects, election and predestination and the hardening of hearts and God is the, the potter and we're clay and for his own glory, God does whatever he wants with clay. Those things are are God-centered, God-glorifying, God-sovereign, theocentric uh, expansions on God's redemptive plan. It is sometimes seen that that Paul puts his chapter on Calvinism in the middle of his explanation of the gospel. And that's what Romans 9 to 11 is doing there. My friends, that is not what Romans 9 to 11 is doing there. It, It is not a parenthesis in the logical flow of Paul's explanation of the gospel. It is integral to Paul's explanation of the gospel. Look at Romans 9 and verse 6. He says, It is not as though the word of God has failed. This becomes the linchpin for understanding why Romans 9 to 11 is in this letter about the gospel that spends eight chapters explaining the substitutionary work of Christ whereby God satisfies his own wrath by placing Jesus on the cross in the place of sinners. And everyone who believes in the gospel by faith gets forgiveness of sin, adoption into God's family, instantaneous justification, the guarantee of eternal life, the indwelling presence of the Spirit, absolute security so that they will never fall away and never be separated from God's love. Staggering promises, gospel promises. And then look at verse one. We get back here to Paul's heart for his countrymen. 
his Savior's heart of grief for their apostate state. He says, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. Four different ways Paul says, I'm telling you the truth. Because what he says next is hard to believe. I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. Do you feel that way about your persecutors? (laughs) Compassionate sorrow for those who want to kill you. That was Paul. He says, I could wish that I myself were possibly accursed, separated from from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Who's he talking about? Verse 4, Israelites. To whom belong the adoption as sons, the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises? To whom belong the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the promises that come with them? And from whom is the Messiah, who is overall God-blessed forever? So the incarnation of God belongs properly to Israel. And so Paul weeps, he grieves And he acknowledges here that they are separated from all of those good things that they were given. This separation comes right on the heels of chapter 8. Do you remember it? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. We're being delivered over as sheep to the slaughter. But in all these things we super conquer through Him who loved us. I'm convinced that nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ. Death, life, angels, principalities, things present, things to come, powers, height, depth, any other created thing. But Israel's separated. Sometimes the chapter breaks are unhelpful. We should move from the no separation clause in the gospel to the Israel is separated paragraph of chapter nine. And what does Paul say next? Verse six, The word of God has not failed. Why? Because we should think the word of God has failed at this point. God, you just made these magnificent promises that I could never be separated and nothing could ever separate me and Israel separated. You made promises to them too. I got a whole book of them. You said things like the moon and the stars and the sun will will not stop shining until all these promises are fulfilled. You said that you're a God who doesn't change his mind and doesn't lie. What's the deal? Is is God's word falling down? Does it fail? And Paul here gives a threefold answer to the question, is God's word failing because Israel is separated? And the answer is no in three parts. And that's what Romans 9 to 11 is detailing. The first answer is not all Israel is Israel. Look at the next verse, or the the second half of verse 6. They are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. And there he's using the word Israel in two different ways. Spiritual Israel would be the Israelites who are spiritually alive. He described them earlier in this letter. It just means a Jew born anew, a a, a born-again, literal descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, an Israelite who embraced Messiah. That's a spiritual Israelite. And not everybody who rides Abraham's coattails is actually a spiritual Israelite. You don't get into heaven because of your parents' faithfulness. You don't get in by heredity. You don't get in by riding the coattails of a nationality. And to prove that, Paul goes through the the breakdown. Abraham had sons. Not all of them believed. Isaac had sons. Jacob had sons. And then there's this division according to God's grace in the line of descent. Jews don't get to heaven because they're Jews. They get to heaven the same way anybody gets to heaven, by faith, by God's grace, predicated on the finished work of Messiah at the cross. Whether they were born before the cross, after the cross, it doesn't matter. There's only one way people get to heaven. It's by Christ's sacrifice at the cross. That only comes by grace and through faith. The second answer to the question, has the word of God failed, uh, comes uh, later on in the doctrine of the remnant. God always keeps a remnant. Look down at chapter 11, 
He rephrases the question there. He says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people. How do we know God hasn't rejected his people in total? Because Paul's a Christian. He's a Jew who actually is born again. And this doctrine of the remnant says this is nothing new. And he takes us back in history to the time of Elijah. Elijah thought he was alone. He thought he was the only faithful Jew in Israel. And God revealed to him, I have reserved 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. You're not alone. God keeps his own. This is by grace. This is by God's gracious choice, verse 5. It is by his election. Verse 6 makes it clear, if it's by grace, it's not on the basis of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. Okay, you get these themes of election and and God's love and, and securing predestination in these chapters, but the context of it is the problem of Israel. It goes back to it in verse 7. What then? What Israel is seeking, it is not obtained? Verse 11, did they stumble so as to fall? And then Paul explains, Right now, during the times of the Gentiles, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, meaning until every last non-Jew that God wants to save comes to faith in Jesus Christ, God is doing something different. By mercy, He's bringing people like us into Messiah Jesus, into Israel's Messiah. And he gives this wonderful illustration of the olive tree. Israel is depicted as the cultivated olive tree in the garden tended by the gardener. It's shapely, it's been pruned, it's been watered, it's been fertilized. It grows the way a gardener wants it to. And then there's those other olive trees You know, when the the birds took some olives and then it goes through the digestive system and then lands somewhere else and just happens to grow? And it's not shaped right. Nobody looks at that and says, ooh, a garden. At that point, it's a weed. It's outside of cultivation. It's not fertilized except by natural processes. And it happens to grow and it's got scraggly limbs and weird fruit and it's not cultivated. It's wild. And God compares Gentiles to those wild, scraggly olive bushes that were not in the garden. They weren't in the commonwealth. They weren't cared for and tended. They they didn't have the oracles of God. They were outsiders to the promises. And, And that's us, Gentiles. And Gentiles are are cut off from those scraggly bushes. And then they are grafted in. I don't know if you've tried to graft uh, citrus in your yard yet. You know, you you, you really want one of those uh, sweet Arizona sweet oranges or a a Valencia orange or or better yet a clementine um, or whatever it is Vince Famosa has in his yard. It's the best orange I've ever tasted. And, And you'd love to stick that onto your ugly ornamental orange tree. That, that grows bitter fruit like the one in my front yard. If you know how to graft citrus, please come talk to me and secretly steal away to the Famosa's yard, cut off a limb and bring it over. But the point was the horticulturist could, could cut off a limb and graft it into the rich roots of a cultivated, fertilized, well cared for tree. The cultivated, cared for roots are the rich promises of the original olive tree. The rich root of Israel, promises God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we scraggly Gentiles got cut off, severed off from where we were in the wrong family, wrong promises, wrong oracles, and graciously by God's mercy grafted in. And you know what that does for us Gentiles? We say, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, me, what am I doing here? We say, mercy, mercy. We say grace, we say election, we say love. Look what God did. I wasn't thinking of that. It's just gospel. And you know what we're tempted to do sometimes, according to Romans 11? As we're in that new grafted relationship and the rich root of the olive tree, which is Israel, we look down and there's some branches on the ground. 
And they've been cut off. Why? According to Romans 11, they've been cut off for unbelief. You know what Paul says to us Gentiles? Do not despise the natural branches. Don't look around at the remnant Jews in the tree of the church and go, "Uh, I'm better than you, I'm a Gentile. And don't look at the ones cut off for unbelief and despise them. Listen, we ought to pray for Israel in her apostate condition. We ought to pray that God would graft in the natural branches. In fact, Romans 11 says God will do that. In fact, it's much easier for God to graft in Jews to the rich root of that olive tree than it was for him to graft in us Gentiles. It's more natural. And the third reason Paul says the word of God has not failed is what he reveals at the end of chapter 11, that he will do exactly that. Look at verse 25. I do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Why is it a partial hardening, by the way? Because Jews like Paul are in. It's not total. So what's coming after the partial hardening is something radically different than Jews coming in generation by generation as part of the remnant theology. What happens next is totally different. After the partial hardening, after the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, verse 25, then you get verse 26, all Israel, future tense, will be saved. He doesn't mean everyone that's ever been a Jew back to the time of Abraham. He's not saying every generation of Jews from all time, even those already dead and in judgment, will somehow get saved. He means at a future period, the entirety of the nation will believe and be saved. And then he gives the Old Testament text to confirm this, and it is a quote of the new covenant from Jeremiah 31. And God even says, this is my covenant with them, Jacob, in verse 26, Israel in verse 26. He's not talking about somebody else that that plays the part of Israel. He's talking about Israel. When I take away their sins. Verse 28, from the standpoint of the gospel, they, same group, Israel, are enemies for your sake, Christian. Do you hear that? The people he's talking about right now in their current state are enemies of the gospel. There are some uh, contemporary Jews that I will listen to on the radio, and I, I love hearing their perspective. Worldview, politics, economics, work ethic are driven by a biblical worldview, an Old Testament biblical worldview, and yet they reject the gospel. And maybe you've seen some of the interviews uh, where, for instance, John MacArthur sits with Ben Shapiro and explains Isaiah 53. You can look it up on YouTube. It's stunning. And they are enemies of the gospel. That's the reality of their current spiritual condition. Second half of verse 28, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. What is God saying there? I made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I won't go back on it. Verse 29, for the gifts And the calling of God are irrevocable, cannot be changed, can't go back on it. God acknowledges their disobedience, their apostate condition. Jesus indicted them for their religious hypocrisy and their emptiness. Paul knew that they were attempting to be religious on their own merit, attain their own righteousness, and rejecting the righteousness that God offers as a free gift in the gospel. God knows all of that. And he loves the nation for the sake of the promises that he himself made. If you want help thinking through this, how can both things be true in verse 28, I would commend to you Matt Waymire's article in the Master Seminary Journal. I have it for you up here on the screen. You could take a screenshot of it. Or if you want these further resources on Israelology, uh, just send me a text or an email. I'll send you this short bibliography. Um, but Matt Waymire uh, spends this article dealing with this dual status of Israel in verse 28. How can they be simultaneously enemies of the gospel and beloved by God? That's the present condition. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you have done and recorded in your word.
Thank you for the things you have promised that have not yet come to fulfillment. We eagerly anticipate you keeping your word. We pray that you would align our hearts with yours. We pray that we would see in Israel's disobedience the dangers of hard-heartedness in our own Christian lives. And I pray that we would revel in the glories of you being a covenant-keeping God who is eternally trustworthy. Help us, O Lord, to trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen.